Hi there, my name is Rachel Wilson. It's great to be with you to join you at Spring Harvest this year. And today, in just these few short minutes, I'm going to share some of, some of my reflections and perspective on being a special needs parent and how that feeds into your theme this year of really God's great upside down spreadsheet, the way in which God flips the natural world order and allows his kingdom to come through the week. And that includes us as parents as well. Several years ago, first, our first child was diagnosed with regressive autism. We had no idea. We went into parenting really expecting uh, for it to be a really significant, really valuable um, chapter of our life, but certainly not for it to swallow our lives whole. And that has been our experience. All of our friends started to have babies around similar times. And when we had our son, we really thought we'd nailed it. We really thought uh, we had this parenting thing mastered. We had him in a great sleep routine. Uh, he was sleeping through the night for about 10 weeks. In fact, we felt like we were doing so well at it that at about nine months, we thought, hey, we're great at this. Let's go for a second child. I got pregnant really quickly, thankfully, with our daughter, Anna. And it was really after that that life started to be thrown up in the air as we experienced all sorts of unexpected challenges. Probably the first red flag for us was uh, Zeke's 18 month check. And he still wasn't walking and he'd never crawled. And there were certain things that he couldn't do that we didn't really worry about, that we didn't think really mattered. Things like pointing or, and he hadn't really started to speak yet, but he just seemed like a super chilled kid. And so we weren't overly concerned. I was, uh, it was actually my due date that that 18 month check happened on. Uh, so I had all sorts of emotions and hormones flying around anyway. And it was then that the health visitor said to us that she had some concerns and would be referring him to the paediatrician. Over the coming months and really over the next few years, all of life got thrown up in the air as he was diagnosed with autism, but really more significantly for us in that chapter of our life, he went into a nine month regression where he lost the speech, language, uh, many of his mobility skills, many of his play skills that he'd learned uh, and his life went into reverse. He became very anxious and very withdrawn. At almost exactly the same time, our daughter Anna started to have seizures unexpectedly and at the age of one was diagnosed with epilepsy. At that time, we were just hit really with uh, the grief of trying to keep the show on the road, of keep parenting, keep surviving, keep these kids alive, keep everybody showered, everybody fed, while also dealing with grief as we started to realise that our parenting journey was going to look very different to the contemporaries around us. Zeke having been diagnosed with autism and then gone through a regression, uh, we then hit the following year, our daughter um, hit two and a half and she hit all of her two month, two year milestones only for her development to go into regression as well. That second experience was much more painful and much more lonely for us because we knew many people with one child with special needs and we could get our heads around that. But we didn't know anyone with two children with special needs. And after all the losses of Zeke's development, to then experience it on a far greater scale with Anna uh, was really heartbreaking. It put our marriage under strain. Uh, it meant for us at the time, it felt like the death of dreams, to be honest. We were told at that point that we would never have a conversation with our children, that they would never live independently, that we would always be responsible for their care. Since then, things have moved on. So we wrote a book many years ago in 2013 called The Life You Never Expected, which is based, a lot of what I'm gonna to say today is based on that book. Uh, but that title really has flipped several times for us as we've experienced the joys and the disappointments and the intense sleep deprivation and the challenges and the repetition sometimes that comes with parenting children with special needs. So our eldest child is now 14 and he, his development and his, um, his ability to communicate and learn and 
socialised move has surpassed anything we ever could have been told or expected. We've seen incredible breakthrough in his life. But we've also known the pain of our daughter's outcomes being far more complex and her need being far more um, challenging to manage on a day-to-day -day basis. Anna's now 12 and really with a very high level of need. Her regression wasn't a one-off and she had to, she's had repeated regressions throughout her childhood, leaving her skills at a very, um, a very low level. Since we wrote the book as well, we've had a third child called Sam. Sam is neurotypical, so at the moment we're on this steep learning curve of working out how do we parent three different children with three vastly different needs. And most days it feels like we are attempting to herd cats or to rugby tackle a snooker table or something in between. We are completely out of our depth still. But what I want to share with you today is the glimmers um, of hope, of God's goodness, and of course faithfulness that we're seeing played out day to day now. When we wrote the book, we wrote it from a very raw perspective. We were living through it. It was, it was really challenging. Life continues to be hard, but we're able to reflect a little bit more now and just to see the threads of gold, the strands of God's goodness that have run uh, throughout our parenting journey thus far. Obviously, we're not finished. We're currently facing a house full of hormones. So if any of you listening have any wisdom on that, we're more than happy to hear from you as well. One of the things that caught me by surprise, I think in parenting children with special needs, was perhaps how capitalist my mindset was. Let me explain what I mean by that. We all live in a post-industrial world. We're not, we're not in the agricultural world that Jesus was preaching to and that the apostles were writing to and writing about. We live in the world of the iPhone. We live in the world of the spreadsheet. And I hadn't even realised that I was thinking in these terms or these categories until I probably had children with special needs. You see, when we had children, it wasn't that we had dramatic aims for them to be doctors or lawyers or, or any of those things. We went in, we really wanted our children to be happy. And at our most difficult stages, particularly when Zeke and Anna were small, that was one of the most challenging things actually about parenting children with special needs. Everybody wants their kids to be happy. And when your children don't reach that threshold of happiness, you can feel like an incredible failure as a parent. You can also feel incredible guilt for the amount of money that the state has to pour into your children. That was the position I found myself in. I started to do the maths. I started to think about the MRIs, the EEGs, the ECGs, the speech therapy, the occupational therapy, the supportive footwear, the special educational placements, the EHC plans, all these things. I was thinking the state is pouring money into my children. And suddenly it occurred to me that we've been told they're never going to gain employment. We think, they're wrong. We think actually the state was wrong about telling us that in the first place, because we're already seeing those expectations surpass, particularly with our son. But at the time, it felt like the cost to the state was incredibly high. At the same time, the cost of parenting our children emotionally and psychologically and even spiritually felt really high on us as well. It felt like we were pouring and pouring and pouring into them. And the strange thing about my concern about that was that I'd walked with God through my teenage years with a real heart to serve people living in poverty. And I had no problem with the idea of my life being a life that was filled with sacrifice. I, like, I leapt, um, I, I really um, lapped up stories of missionaries out in Africa. And I didn't mind making sacrifices. I didn't mind a high level of cost as you pour into somebody else's life. I think for me, the unexpected area of it was that I was pouring my energy, my heart and soul, my emotion, all into these two very little children, very little needy children. And I was doing it just to get them to eat some measure of dinner or to um, engage in just a few minutes of a play activity. And it felt like cost, cost, cost. And if you can imagine that first column in the spreadsheet just being filled up, financial cost to the state, cost to me. And over these last few years, one of the miracles that God's done in my life is that he has taken that spreadsheet and he has flipped it upside down. You see, the way in which God allocates value 
and cost and worth is completely different to the way in which our world does it. It's not a financial spreadsheet. Throughout scripture, again and again and again, God shows concern for the weak. He shows a bias towards the poor. He shows a desire to work with the least likely and he establishes them as oaks of righteousness and he causes them to flourish. You see, God doesn't think in our spreadsheets or if he does, he flips it upside down and he welcomes in the vulnerable. But he doesn't just welcome them in and make and, and as a blessing, as a promise, a fulfilment of Abraham's stars in the sky promise. He doesn't just make them a blessing to me. He makes my children and he makes those we're working with and those we're standing alongside who are on the very margins of society. He causes them to be a source of blessing to the whole earth. And I've seen that again and again and again. They they say that everybody's a fountain or a drain. We all know those friends that we spend time with Friends that leave us feeling buoyant, happy in God, encouraged, blessed, built up. And we also know the people that we spend time with sometimes that can cause us to feel drained and who are needy, who cause us to feel, come away in some way feeling depleted. And we often try to live our lives and our friendships based on the idea of somehow equaling, equalizing out these forces of, of receiving and giving. And there's a lot of human wisdom in that as well. But what God is concerned with is he's concerned with taking the needy and causing them to flourish. In fact, in Matthew 5, in the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, as Jesus standing there, I love Jonathan Pennington's commentary because he flips the word blessed and he uses a better word than blessed. So rather than saying blessed are the poor or blessed are the merciful, or blessed are the weak, he says flourishing, flourishing are the poor, flourishing are the merciful flourishing other week. God's desire is for our children not to just be recipients of a blessing, but to be sources and to be vehicles uh, and to be a means of blessing the whole earth as they grow into flourishing in his presence and in his great spreadsheet. You see, our kids are a fulfillment of Abraham's stars in the sky prophecy, but they even touch nations. A friend of mine, I love her story because when her son was born with really complex medical needs alongside Down syndrome, she was given a prophecy over his life. And the prophecy said that he would be a blessing to the nations. And that seemed incredibly unlikely. At that point, his life expectancy was predicted to be very short. But one of the things that his parents did at that point was hosting people who were over for a conference from other nations. In fact, they hosted an apostolic figure from Kenya and he came over having just the week before been asked to sit on a panel, an advisory panel to shape policy on the way in which disabled people are treated in Kenya. He's a really busy guy, great godly guy, but very busy and and stretched. And he said, I'm so sorry, I cannot sit on this government panel. I just don't have the time. After just five days of staying in my friend's house, He went back and said, I've got to change my mind. I must sit on that panel panel in Kenya and shape the way in which people with disabilities are viewed. You see, her little boy became a source of blessing to the nations and fulfilled that prophecy over his life. It's something I've seen in my children in time and time again, because if we're going to talk about spreadsheets or we're going to talk about economies, we can also talk about the way in which children in special needs draw out mercy, compassion, and increase the currency of those spiritual values, those fruits of the spirit at work in our culture and at work in our nation and at work in our churches as well. They draw out mercy, compassion, justice in others. Just the other day, my daughter Anna, who has very few words and very limited communication, did something fascinating on a Sunday morning. She went around the church congregation and she chose three women to kiss on the cheek. It's very rare for her to do that. And what was fascinating was that these three women were sitting in completely different parts of the church building, but each of them were struggling with addiction. 
and Anna went to three separate parts of our large church family. And she went and each woman, as she kissed them on the cheek, they started to cry. And for me, that was just a moment, just another example of many, of how Anna's life continues to touch and draw out the goodness of God, the mercy of God for those living on the margins. It's something that my home life um, focuses on, but it's also something my work life focuses on. I work for a charity called Jubilee Plus. And really at Jubilee Plus, we're passionate about churches having mercy and justice in their very DNA, running projects that reach the weak, but also being people that reach the weak. Every member of every congregation having a heart that reflects God's for those on the margins. I love that Anna even is part of that vision. She doesn't need words. God is causing her to flourish. He is causing her to be a source of blessing to the people around her. You see, I don't know what situation your children are in right now. And I don't want to underplay the challenge of parenting children with special needs. Just yesterday, you would have found me in a very different emotional place, a very different mood, walking along the seafront. In fact, I had my headphones on and I was listening to a song called Foundations by Luke Hellenbroth. And it was saying, out of my brokenness, you see foundations. Sometimes in the wreckage of our life, in the shipwreck of our lives, God sees the foundations to build something new. And it's, sometimes it's the foundations to build a family that was never the one that we saw coming. But it's a beautiful, beautiful witness to him. I love the story in Matthew 26, when the woman goes to um, see Jesus at the house in Bethany, it's the house of Simon the leper, and she pours out ointment on him. And it's extravagant. It's, uh, it's, people look and see, is that wasted? The amount of love, the amount of mercy that's required to, to pour out. And Jesus says she will be remembered. She will be remembered wherever the gospel is preached. I don't doubt that as you face your journey of parenting with whatever challenges it is, whether it's special needs, whether it's mental health, your own or your children's, I don't underplay the cost. But I would encourage you to look to your saviour because in him you have a model of somebody who has poured themselves out on behalf of the little one. He's poured himself out on behalf of the one on the margins, the one that others might not see. I love what Rachel Yankovic says in her book, because she says there's no public humiliation. There's no cost that we can go through that ever surpasses the cross. Jesus models what it is to parent well. He models the extreme cost, but he also models what it is to raise up oaks of righteousness, to draw in people. That's his life on earth as he went around preaching, was about drawing people in and raising up the unlikely and causing them to be central in his kingdom. And that's really my message to you today, to be encouraged. I'd like to finish just with some thoughts on one quote by Charles Spurgeon. I, I, I read this quote years ago when we were in the depths of the challenge of parenting children with special needs. And it says this, it says, he says, I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me on the rock of ages. And I remember reading that and thinking, I will never kiss the wave of regression. I can never kiss that wave. It was too painful at that point. But I have over the coming last few years, and I wouldn't say I wake up every morning kissing that wave, but I am getting closer to kissing that wave because it has shown me something of the tender-hearted mercy of God, something of the love of Jesus for the weak and his desire to draw them in, for them not to be on the margins, but to be on the very centre piece of his vision for humanity, for kingdom of God coming. I'm learning to kiss that wave, and I'm also learning that the love of God is deep to me when he crosses my desires as well as when he meets them. As we faced with our second child, the same thing happening again, but only more severely. That felt like a hard, like a severe mercy, like a hard truth to come to terms with, that God was showing his deep love for us, 
even as he crossed our desires, just as much as when he meets them. I called out to God and I prayed for Anna. And I remember for six months afterwards, she continued to regress. And that still causes me confusion. But I am seeing something beautiful and different about the character of God, the mercy, the kindness, the love of God in her weakness and in her challenges that I simply would never have perceived if my story had only been one of breakthrough. So wherever you are, whatever your challenges are, I just encourage you to fall on the one who is merciful, to go to the rock of ages, maybe even once in a while to kiss the wave that throws you upon him day in, day out, that brings your need of him right to the surface and out of the shipwreck, perhaps of your what feels like a shipwreck of your parenting life, of the challenges that God would be kind to you and that you would celebrate his goodness. Our testimony has really been that we have seen the goodness of God in the land of the living. And at one point that felt out of reach. At one point that felt like I could see his eternal goodness, his eternal faithfulness, but I struggled to see it in my kitchen when my kids were pacing or having seizures or melting down in anxiety or crying when the doorbell rang. I struggled to see it then. But more and more, as the years have passed, I've seen the kindness and the goodness of God. And my prayer for you today, as you listen, is that even as you're sitting in your sitting room or watching this YouTube channel, that the Holy Spirit would come and meet you now and that it, he would again draw your eye toward Jesus and that you would see the smile of your father as well as you pour out that ointment day in, day out, as you invest in your children May God cause them to flourish. May he cause a blessing upon your family. God bless you today.